thank you for connecting to our broadcast. We pray that it connects, leads, and maybe introduces you to a growing and life-changing relationship with Jesus. Let's go into today's message. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. I am Pastor Mario, the lead pastor of Growth Point Church. I want to take this opportunity for thanking you for coming in and supporting and liking and subscribing. It's because of your generous giving and support. It causes us to be able to reach into homes and to households we would not be able to do without you. Speaking of that, uh, if you haven't liked or subscribed to our channel and to our page, please do so right now. Uh, today's message is talking about, well, the title is, uh, He Still Speaks uh, Through Storms or In Storms. And uh, whether you're in a storm right now, uh, whether you came out of a storm or whether you might be going into a storm, uh, sometimes we're so focused on the storm that we're in or the storm that we came out of uh, that we don't think that God is speaking in the midst of it. And um, a few years ago, uh, when we were in Mississippi, we went through our family, went through a major, major storm uh, that uh, at the time we couldn't really see God. Um, but had it not been for the storm, I don't think we would have seen God. So there's some storms that you might be experiencing in your life that if it wasn't for that interruption, if it wasn't for that, that brief season or sometimes an extended season, um, you might not know what you know without that storm. So that's where this message comes from. For the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about how in the midst of storms, sometimes if you still yourself, you'll find that he's still speaking. Let's go into today's message. Five years ago today, hey Claudia, five years ago today, you go to the screen, the next screen, five years ago today, we moved back from Mississippi to Kentucky. Today is the very day that we moved back. If you look at those pictures on the screen there, those are pictures, Singleton said it, we look rough. And you have to understand why we look rough, because we were in a storm. I left Bible study on a Tuesday night, July the 29th, and I served a ministry for nine years. And as soon as church was over, after I'd just done the movie premiere of Get On Up, the James Brown biopic, I'd just done the red carpet for that. And, um, the next week, we had Bible study. Our Bible study is not like the Bible studies we had. We had full praise and worship. It was the Bible study that just never ended. It was like 7 o'clock to 9.30. It just never stopped. Uh, you have to be a part of Apostolic Church to understand that. But anyhow, so we were there forever. After Bible study had ended, I went back to my office, and I, I was told that the senior leader wanted to see me. I went back to the office, and in that office, my wife didn't come to Bible study that night. She later on told me that she felt something wasn't right, as she tends to do often. She has a strong sense of discernment. Do not mess with her, because she will tell you your life story. But um, So she sensed that God had was doing something, and she stayed back. I went back to that office that night, and I was met with the deacons and trustees and all the senior leadership, and I was told that night that I wanted the world and I didn't want ministry, that I was too worldly to be spiritual, and that it was time for them to let me go because they could not deal with me because I was not a humble leader. I could not be taught. And that night, our entire life shifted. Everything that we had known was shifted in a matter of moments. I went home and had to explain to my family that I was released from ministry because I was too worldly. Because the movie was too much. And, you know, in the holiness, you have to understand you can't be in movies and be in church. You just, they just don't mix. And you can't do many different things outside of the building. You're taught only to serve in the four walls. So I was doing too much and growing too much outside of that. And um, lots of murderous things were said about our family and I. But the Lord told us to be quiet and say nothing. 
uh, remember the next Sunday, and I've said this before, and I think I'm at a point now that I can, I can say it without breaking down, but I remember the very first Sunday after I was let go, um, Miles was, I don't know how old Miles was then, but um, well, five years ago, I failed mass, I don't know, but anyhow, he, he um, that Sunday, we didn't know where to go to church, and we woke up that morning, and Miles said to me, he said, duh, he said, where are we going to church? And that was the first time in my adult life or my life period that I was without a church home. I never knew the feeling of not having a church. So we went down the street to a community church, a community chapel, I believe it was called. And uh, we went there, and as soon as I walked in, I didn't want to be known. It was predominantly white church. I felt like we wouldn't be known or seen. <laughs> Why? In a predominantly white church, I don't know. But we went in, and they said, Brother Mario, you're going to do the opening prayer. I was like, oh... I don't want to pray. And the first song that I heard that day, I was so broken. But you don't, I don't know if any of you understand when you're trying to be strong for your whole family, but you're breaking up inside. So my family knows me to be very together. Um, a lot of the people at the funeral the other day had a hard time because it's very, it takes me a lot to break to the, down to the point, but some things in life would just take the wind out of you. And it was doing everything I could to keep it together when everything we had known was this ministry dynamic. And how do you explain to your children when the church turns on you? And they knew the sacrifices and stuff. So we went there, and I came to that church broken but strong outwardly. And the very first song they sang was not a song that changed keys, but they sang, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. And tears streamed down my face, thinking about if there was ever a time I needed a friend. It was right then. My, um, those of you who know my Aunt Katie, uh, my uh, wife, my mother-in-law's twin sister, uh, Mel called her and she said what had happened. And my Aunt Katie said in true Aunt Katie form, I'm on my way. <laughs> she had someone bring her to Memphis, I think, which was four and a half hours away from where we lived. She came up there and um, she came and uh, over, she helped pack up our whole entire house. We didn't really tell anybody. We didn't know what we were going to do. We, when storms hit you, it can knock the senses out of you. This is why I'm preaching to anybody who's been there. I'm, I'm still in 21 days of prayer, but sometimes even in a season of consecration, something can come you weren't prepared for and knock you off your footing. And we didn't know how to make decisions. My wife's looking at me, asking me questions. I'm looking at her saying, I don't know. And I don't know is not good for my wife because she needs to know what the next step is. And I'm usually the one who could tell you what's next. I can tell you what's happening in 2021. That's how planned I am. But I just, I didn't have because what I had trusted in failed me. What I had served failed me. And it was a storm that started in the church. And I didn't know what to do with it. I'm used to the storm outside of the church. But the storm that happened in the place that you served, I wasn't prepared for. And it knocked me off my, it just threw me off. And um, so we didn't really tell anybody. Finally, we said, well, our phones had gotten disconnected. Um, we were, it was just a lot of things that were happening at a short span of time. People were saying things in the community and calling and asking, was it true? And I was like, you know, I, I just can't get into all that type of stuff. It was a lot. My children were going to school, having to hear lots of stuff. Um, Tori was going into her freshman year at Jackson State. Uh, it was a lot happening at one time. So we said, we don't know what else to do but to go home. And we don't even know what's going to happen when we get there. We just went home, and uh, we finally decided to come home, and uh, we didn't tell anybody. We didn't make any sudden announcements. I had went somewhere to go get the U-Haul truck that we had hid because we didn't want anybody to know we were moving. Because when you're in a small town like Mayberry, everybody knows what you're doing. So I hid the U-Haul truck somewhere. When I came back from getting the U-Haul truck, there was like 50 or 60 people from the church who had heard what happened and came and said, it's not right. And we came to help you pack because we're sad to see you go. 
what would have took us hours to pack up a U-Haul truck was packed up in 20 minutes because everybody came because when something's wrong, they didn't know what else to do but to help us leave. We drove up to Mississippi, from Mississippi to um, Nicholasville, because Mel's like, are we going to Lexington or Nicholasville? I said, I ain't going to Lexington. You from there. I ain't from there. So I said, I'm going to Nicholasville. <laughs> so, uh, so we decided to go there. We didn't even have money to get a storage. Someone helped us get a storage, and that is what you see the very first, when we got into Mississippi, when we got into Kentucky, we went straight to the storage bin, and people were there waiting for us at the storage bin, helping us to unload our, our truck. We didn't know what our next step was. We went to go stay with my sister in her townhouse, and we stayed there. She had a two-bedroom townhouse. My wife and I, and I and Miles and Darius stayed in a room with two twin beds. My wife and I slept on one bed, and Darius and Miles slept on the other bed, and all of our luggage was in this, in this room, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We would run in every day, and Mel would be running and be like crying, and we would run, and she's like, what are we going to do? I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. Neither of us had a job. We didn't have anything to do, and it was a storm, and in the midst of the storm, I thought that the storm was from the devil. I said all that because you can glorify the wrong person. And everybody was like, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? They were wrong and all these different things. And all I thought was that it was a person and people and a church. And I thought that it was from the devil. But in this scripture, he, Jesus says, let's go to the other side. Do you know that there are some places you won't go unless a storm takes you there? <laughs> I would have stayed where I was as long as I could have been there had a storm not moved me. I'm sitting here rebuking devils, and he said, it's not the devil. I sent the storm because I needed you to get to the other side. John, the 10th chapter, verse 27 says, I hope I'm preaching to somebody right now, says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. The first thing is I want to say to you, he speaks through your transitions and he often orders your stops. There are transitions that are happening in your life that God is speaking through. And not only is he speaking through your transitions, but sometimes when he stops you, he's speaking through him stopping you. Yeah. And sometimes we're rebuking what God is trying to stop. He's like, I'm speaking to you, but you've got to be able to acknowledge when I'm speaking to you. Um, Priscilla Schreier says this, stop searching for God's will and start searching for God himself. Many of us, myself included, and if we did a poll right now, everybody wants to know God's will. Lord, give me your will. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I want to know your will, but none of us say, God, I just want you. If you ask most people, everyone wants to say, I want to know my purpose. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm living in life. But you don't have a relationship with God, hence you won't know your purpose. But if you have a relationship with God, he will give you your purpose. And for me, in that storm and in my family, in that storm, we spent so much time trying to wonder why someone would do that to us or why something like that would happen to us instead of asking God, what are you saying in this storm? What are you speaking? I hope I'm helping somebody because a lot of you are mad at exes who are really not the issue. You're upset as a person, upset at a place, upset at a job, and it's not that. Had that person not revealed themselves to you, you would still be with the wrong person too long. But thank God that he loved you enough to expose that line, Joker, while you could still see it. Still sitting there crying with your girlfriend saying, I can't believe him. Saying, I can't believe I stayed there as long as I did. I thank God that he showed me that he loved me enough to shake things up so that I could move. 
it scares me to think of what I would have become had we stayed there. And had we still been there, and how we would have been 12 years a slave, I don't know what we would have been doing, still doing whatever we could do, and, and, and serving in ministry and losing our family. I said something won't hit you for 10 more years, and how we're serving and we're doing a good job, but losing ourselves while we're doing everything in the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. If you don't know what it is that God wants you to do, call to him. Yeah. Ask him. Call out loud. Say, Lord, I need to know. He said, call to me. I'll answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things that you would have never figured out on your own. Some of you are trying to, you're wearing yourself out trying to write a business plan. Call to him. He'll show you great and mighty things that you did not know. I was talking to uh, one of my Latin brothers, uh, Dr. Timon Maurice Graham, Graham, and I was talking to him. Give me his government name. His mind will be so proud. I was talking to him one time. He just finished his dissertation, and I said, how did you do that? He said, some of those chapters the Lord wrote. It may not mean anything to y'all, but have you ever got to a job interview and you know you weren't prepared for it? And then you knew they weren't going to call you back, but they did and said, you got it. You're like, Lord, <laughs> only you did that. <laughs> Come on, it's the truth. He says, call to me and I'll open and I'll tell you great and mighty things that you did not know. I want to even speak right now to uh, I just, ooh, I feel so, whew, I feel just so, Lord, help me. I don't know what's going on with me right now this season. But I want to speak directly. Belinda's believing God for something in 2020 to open up her own business. She wants to do that. I just want to put it in the atmosphere that it's going to happen, that you're going to have more clients, that you're going to have to turn them down, and your family will not continue to stay in drought, that he's going to make a way in the wilderness. He's going to give you rivers. He's going to give you multiple streams of income. I just want to speak that in the room. That that's what he's going to do. Mm. <sighs> oh, he's speaking in storms. You better stop looking at your debt and crying over it, and you better thank God that eventually trouble's not going to last always. You need to find out what you're going to do with the money that's coming. All right. So he speaks to us. My time's almost up. So he speaks to us. Single time, trying to act right. So he speaks to us. And what he says to us in this text, uh, what he says, Dr. Glenn, is that he says Jesus tells them to get to the other side. But Kamisha, what is so wonderful about him saying get to the other side? Don't y'all just feel something breaking in the room? I just, whew, Jesus, I just feel something breaking. She got a word, but it's also coming for you, too. I'm telling you, what? <laughs> Y'all better start writing down some things. So, Jesus told them, quote it on push me, Jesus told them to get to the other side. But the part about being to the other side that we miss, <laughs> this is what we miss, is that Jesus got in the boat with them. We are so focused on the storm that we forget who's with us. Jesus didn't say, go to the other side and I'll leave you by yourself. He said, go to the other side, but I'm going to go with you. Storms have a way of making you forget who's in the boat with you. So the thing that Jesus speaks to is while the storm started happening, and it says that as the boats were filling up, and the thing is, this is what's important, Mama Donna, is that it, uh, the one version says there were other boats with them. Do you not know, Rob, that when you're going through something that you're not the only person going through a storm? A lot of us, that's why you have to be careful of listening to the devil tell you to be isolated and get away from people and unfriend people and don't come to church and don't come to small groups and don't start to, don't answer people's call because the devil wants you in an isolated position to make you think you're the only one almost sinking. 
because you start telling yourself stories that the devil wants you to believe. He makes you believe that you're by yourself. Nobody cares about you. No one's going to be there to help you. So you're by yourself. But it says other boats were filling with water too. But this is what's important. In the midst of this, Jesus falls asleep. What do you do when Jesus takes a nap? In the midst of what you're going through, he goes to sleep. So 23 says that they sailed, he fell asleep, a windstorm came. Fill with water. And the first thing he teaches us in my remaining minutes, he says, first thing, settle down. <laughs> it's real practical. If y'all want something deep, come back another time. He wants you to settle down. Because a lot of times, Joanna, sometimes your distractor will cause you to overlook the deliverer. <laughs> I'm just trying to do the best I can. You get so distracted. By the storms, and I'm almost sinking, and the water's coming, and I'm up to here in debt, and I'm up to here in bills, and I'm up to here in I'm up to here in fake friends, and I'm up to here in I can't find a good man. I've been looking, I can't find him. Everybody's on the DL these days. I can't find nobody. I'm sorry, excuse me, wrong church. I'm just trying to. I don't know what to do. I can't find nobody, and I'm just looking. I'm just up to here everywhere, and you get so distracted that you forget the deliverer is in the boat with you. Philippians 4, chapter 6 through 8 says, I hope this is ministering to you. It says, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, do not be anxious about anything. Someone say anything. Amen. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, it means anything. <laughs> I just want to sound deep for the people in the back. It means anything. Take everything that you're thinking about right now. Why are you so anxious about nothing? Staying awake at night is not changing a thing. And I'm speaking to myself. I've, my wife and I have been tossing turns. She's been coughing and going through some. She's better now. She was sick. But I've been staying awake because of my mind. And I have to tell my mind, you are not fixing anything by thinking. Go to sleep. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. Yes. Why is it that we think about stuff we're not praying about? Yes. Come on, church. You ask somebody what's going on. I got a lot on my mind, but we don't pray. He says, don't think about it, but pray about it. With supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. And this is what we miss. We think P-I-E-C-E. -E. He'll give me a piece of himself. Oh, no. He'll give you a whole piece. I don't want a slice. I want all of it. He says, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Has anybody in the room ever had peace that you couldn't understand? Has something happened to you? You got bad news and everybody came to you to try to figure out how you're doing. And you're like, I'm good. I'm all right. <laughs> How you feel? I'm all right. Because he'll give you peace that will surpass even your understanding. Everybody in your family is known to clock. So they sitting there waiting in a minute. She's going to go off. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I'm good. And sometimes when you say you're good, it's scary to people. <laughs> come on. Come on. It might be real. Because they so used to you being ratchet. And you just sitting there staring your tea like. I'm good. <laughs> I ain't gone to the sunken place. I'm all right. <laughs> He'll give you a peace. Someone say, I need that type of peace. <laughs> Not only will it surpass your understanding, but it will guard your heart and your mind. He'll give you the type of peace that will protect you from people. You'll get to a point in your life that you'll start saying, you know what? My peace is too important for you to taint with it. 
it, it's too important. I fought too hard. I've gone through too much for to me to get to this point for you to give me for me to give you my peace. I just can't do it because my peace is so important. So he says, it's peace. It'll guard your heart and your mind. The next thing he tells us is that he says they was, the waters were filling and all that type of stuff. He says they went, they woke him. He said, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind, the waving the waves, and they, they ceased and there was a calm. The next thing he teaches us, stay woke. Before Childish Gambino came out with it, Stay woke is an urban vernacular that means to stay awake, but it means to stay informed. <laughs> For y'all who went to a song, I'm going to explain it to you. I try to spiritualize your mind. Y'all just like, ah, 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 no. It means to keep informed of things going on. Hear me. Things going on around you in times of turmoil and conflict. They want Jesus, but Jesus did not respond to them. He responded to what was troubling them. He said, I'm so woke that I realize that you are not even the issue. That's the issue. You have to learn how to see the devil in the details. Many of us are going off on people and it's not the person. It's the spirit in the person. Jesus. Jesus woke up and he didn't respond. And the reason he said, I'm not responding to you. He said, just because I'm not responding to you doesn't mean I'm not awake. And we have to understand this type of stuff because there have been many times that I have a lot of my pastor friends or pastor uh, compadres who try to tell me we need to talk about all the injustices that are going on in the world and all the racism and the things that are going on in the political climate and all those different things. And though I am awake and though I am woke and though I am aware of those things, I don't feel like I need to take a need to spend 45 minutes to do a political sermon every single week just for you to know I'm woke. Because I realize that I wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and against spiritual wickedness in high places. I don't have time to put Trump or 45 in my message. All I got to do is rebuke spiritual wickedness in high places. I don't have to change my message to Mike Brown or, or Trayvon Martin or any of those people just for you to say, oh, my pastor is woke. I'm woke because I rebuke devils when you sleep. I come against racism for a living. I don't have to preach about it. I rebuke it under my breath. Jesus said, just because I'm not responding to you don't mean I'm not woke. He said, I know what to address when it's time. I speak to the winds. I speak to these waves. I speak to this water. I speak to it. I say, obey. And the reason that they obey me is because in the beginning, I told them how far they can go anyway. I divided the land from the water and I said, you can go this far, you can go that far. So when I wake up, I'm like, don't make me. Don't make me speak to you again. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And he, Come on, church, you know the Bible. He said, I was there before you knew my name. <laughs> so we have to learn, your notes, learn to attack the issue instead of attacking the person. Y'all got quiet. <laughs> Learn how to attack the issue and not the person. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at what you're settling for. I'm not upset with you that you don't have a job. I'm upset with you that there are jobs and you don't want them. We want to thank you for your prayers, support, and generous giving that makes this ministry possible. For more ways to connect, visit online at growthpointchurch.org. If you enjoyed today's message, like our page, share the message with your friends, or take a screenshot and share on your social stories and tag us at MyGrowthPoint. Until next time, keep growing.